Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, First of all I would like to thank uh, Brother Shahran He has really uh, summarized our past lecture very very well And I think those were the take home for the past lecture And um, uh, today, inshallah, we are going to look uh, at um, uh, another series of our topics. And this time I'll be focusing on contracts. Uh, the contracts, I'll be looking at some of those uh, concepts, definition, and those relationships. And in the coming class next week, inshallah, we'll look at the application of those contracts. And uh, some of you are familiar with the contracts and there may be some who are relatively okay, but there could be some people who are still getting themselves introduced uh, to this theory of um, Islamic contracts. Now, my reason of sharing the theoretical aspects first is because when we discuss the practice next week, you will be able to compare between the theory and the practice and see where the gap lies. Because today we have so many applications in the market and uh, most of them tend to be confusing. So people tend to ask a question, which one is the right Islamic one? Is it uh, X or Z? So whenever you talk about something Islamic, the main reference of course is the Quran and Sunnah. And then look at the works of our scholars in the heritage and then see to what extent these practices in the market conform to those uh, contracts. So I think the take home uh, inshallah for next week will be, uh, you need to grasp those theory and then when we discuss the practice, so you should be the judge to see the extent to which those practices conform or they have diverted from the real uh, principles and spirit of uh, uh, Islamic contracts. So let me share my, my slides at the moment. Um, just a minute, Allah. Okay, I'm trying to share the screen. This one, huh? This one? You want to share this? Yeah, this okay. slide. Click here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Is it there? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Great. Okay. So now, inshallah, we'll be looking at um, this uh, module three. Basically, from this module, we'll be looking at the importance and dimension of contracts, definition of contracts the essential element of contracts and of course we'll be looking at the classification of contracts before we we conclude um, and at the end of this session we should be able to achieve the following outcome one is we should be able to explain and appreciate the need for contracts in fiqh appreciate the elements of contracts and their classification and we should be able to appreciate the applications of or the theoretical applications, some of those contracts in fiqh. Now, why are contracts important? Why do we need a contract? Now, the reason why we need a contract firstly is we need a contract first because it's the divine scheme of interdependence, meaning that Allah has created us to be interdependent uh, on one another. Like we find Allah says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, He says, نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ عِشَةٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا سُخْرِيَّةٍ uh, meaning Allah has created us uh, differently. He has given us different level of earnings so that we can work for one another. And through this contract, we 
depend on one another. Somebody may be a seller and the other one is a buyer. Uh, somebody may be an employer and another party is an employee. Uh, so through such a relationship, we have interdependence, which is a divine scheme, which Allah wishes us to fulfill those scheme. And secondly, through contracts, we are able to fulfill and exchange our needs. Uh, because if everybody has their needs, then that interdependence for one another to fulfill our needs would not uh, occur. The other third importance of a contract is the social interaction and cooperation. Uh, normally when people go to the market, uh, they interact. Uh, I remember in the first study that they did about uh, uh, e-business or online business in Malaysia, they found the penetration was very slow. Um, they ask a question, why is it so slow in Malaysia? Although I assume now with the corona, it has picked up so much, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, during that time, one of the reasons they found was that uh, Malaysians were social people. When they go to the shopping center, they go with the family. They put some of the children on the trolley. Some are moving inside the trolley. So they enjoy shopping as a social interaction rather than to go online. So in most markets, we go for social interaction, cooperation. And also contracts enriches our spiritual and material development. Uh, because there's a lot. Sometimes you, you know, go for earning and uh, your expectations are not met. So you tend to uh, have that spiritual enrichment because you have to have high level of tawakul and keep on moving forward and just to towards those earnings. And of course, for those who earn, it's a material development for them. And the other important aspects of contract in Islam is the inculcation of values. Uh, that's why in one of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, a man came and asked and said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu amalin afdal? What is the best form of work? He says, amalu rajulin biyadihi. Uh, a man doing work with his own hands and then every form of um, virtue, every form of trade uh, that is full of, um, that uh, uh, encompasses moral values, uh, work that has ethics, and work that upholds uh, good akhlaq. This is the best form of work which the Prophet Sallallahu says. And today also many scholars, when they look at this hadith, they argue that uh, with the advent of the so-called pandemic and more pandemic coming, uh, more and more people will begin depending on their own work. Huh? Work with their own hands rather than becoming uh, employees to companies to universities etc so this become the best form of work for people to be uh, self-reliant and self-sufficient so inculcating values are very important also aspects of why we need contracts now moving forward these are some of the dimensions of contract we have two dimensions of a contract one dimension is what we call implicit contract which has been defined by our scholars as uh, all the stakeholders that are involved in your contract. For example, if you are a business person, you are doing buying and selling of certain commodities. Let's say you're in agriculture. Um, there are a lot of other implicit stakeholders. That means people who are involved, who are related to your business, but you don't have a formal contract with them. One of it could be the environment. Uh, you have implicit contract with the environment. You have to preserve the environment. Another implicit contract would be the neighbors where you are conducting your business. Another implicit contract could be the animals around you, uh, the government offices. These are all implicit contracts where you don't have formal contract, but they are embedded into your business. So the other dimension is explicit contract, people whom you sign a contract with, you formalize that relationship. 
and this is where the focus of our discussion will be today not on the implicit but on the explicit contract and uh, there are a lot of studies now on the implicit contract things like uh, uh, responsible investment things like uh, sdgs sustainable development goals and so all of these are basically related to implicit contract where they see the impact uh, of your business on your stakeholders uh, but for explicit one are those which you sign contracts directly with them you formalize those relationship and this way our focus is going to be on those explicit contract so we go to the definition of contract uh, as given by the scholars of fiqh they say that aqad means to tie between two ends or one end whether that tie is real or abstract uh, so that means if you tie a rope in one end or you tie both ends uh, whether that tie is real or abstract literally it is a contract so technically it has a general and specific meaning the general meaning given by scholar is that uh, whatever an individual or a company commits to undertake uh, whatever you commit yourself to do, which they use the word azim. Huh? Whenever you want to do something, it becomes a contract because you have committed yourself to do it. So even if you yourself uh, alone uh, in a house or wherever you are, if you say tomorrow I'm going to do such and such, uh, tomorrow I need to begin my exercise, tomorrow I need to begin regular in my prayers tomorrow i need to control my anger tomorrow i need whatever you have committed to do as an azima is a kind of a contract uh, with yourself and this could be either unilateral contract or it could be bilateral contract so unilateral contracts uh, include things like al off and bilateral contracts are things like sale hmm? So we'll be discussing now the detail. So the scholar says um, the technical definition again of a contract is to link between ijab and kabul. That link between offer and acceptance in line with the sharia. So you see the, 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 the lines or the words that I have underlined uh, because there can be a lot of linking between offer and acceptance but they may not be in line with the sharia uh, for example people who are involved in briberies somebody can offer a bribe and the other one can take a bribe this is ijab and kabul but are they in line with the sharia so no so for a sharia defined contract that ijab and kabul must be in line with the sharia uh, in a way that the offer and acceptance have effects on the subject matter or counter values in other words uh, if you go to buy then you must exchange the payment or pay for the commodity in our example here is a computer you come with your cash pay the for, for the computer uh, to ensure that the price reaches the seller and the seller has to ensure that the commodity and a computer in this case is delivered uh, to the buyer so in other words there is an effect on the subject matter the subject matter that is money has reached the seller and then the other subject matter which is a computer has reached the buyer and once this effect uh, takes place then this becomes a contract hmm? As defined by the scholar and later we will see when we discuss the application next week that there are some contracts that uh, you know is done and you don't see the effect of the subject matter on the contract and a typical case is what they call bay al -ina, or superficial sale the inner sale where a sale happens but things uh, don't take uh, uh, things don't uh, uh, take effect hmm? things don't take effect now the essential elements of a contract or pillars are four hmm? 
um, what are the pillars according to the Hanafi school? The pillar is ijab and kabul. That means in any contract, there has to be offer and acceptance. If a contract does not have offer and acceptance, then it is not a valid contract based on the Hanafi schools. While the other three scholars, they say that a contract has four pillars. The first pillar is channel of communication channel of communication or what we call expression uh, the second is called the contracting party one that means the person who offers the contract the third is contracting party two the person who accepts the contract and then the fourth pillar is the counter values or the subject matter which could be price and goods or price and services or price and user fraud so these four are very fundamental so if any of these four are violated then the contract is invalid for example if there is a communication but one of the contracting parties are missing again the contract is not valid or if you have the contracting parties there's a buyer and seller but there's nothing to sell nothing to buy then the contract becomes invalid and we have a lot of cases where sometimes projects are not yet built projects are still in the process and people do buying and selling and the project you know, becomes abundant without both the buyers and sellers uh, getting involved in concluding that contract then this becomes invalid from an islamic perspective so these are the essential elements that we are talking about for example you have a contracting party one as a contracting as a construction company uh, then of course you have the finance companies that is financing uh, the project and the project which is the subject matter here happens to be uh, housing units or residential areas so there has to be ijab and kabul between the um, construction company and of course then the financing company to finance the subject matter which is the housing and sometimes the contract has a lot of other sub contracts uh, this may be the main contracts between the construction company and the finance company but then you have also sub contracts uh, you may have a lot of agents here uh, or you have other managers project managers managing so these are different contracts from the main contracts you can have sub 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 contract but all those contracts are related to each individual companies so but still the subject matter remains the same but you have a lot of other sub contracts now as far as the channel of communication is concerned so any means of communication between two contracting parties which reveal their intention to conclude a contract is acceptable in islam and uh, so most importantly is that when you're communicating an offer or an acceptance then it must be able to reveal the intention of the contracting parties so such expression can either be verbally by words or it can be expressed through writing or it can be by conduct and later we'll see what this conduct are or such expression can also be through sign language now as far as the verbal communication is concerned uh, many of us find that verbal communication is easy it is precise it is clear especially when you are meeting the person who has to accept the offer then it becomes very very easy so meaning ijab and kabul especially when we go to the shop to buy things the shopkeeper is there then you can easily express what you want to buy and he can express what he wants to sell but in terms of verbal communication the interesting thing is al-imam al-shafi rahimahullah he has insisted that as far as marriage is concerned the word nikah and ziwaj should be used no other expression should be used except nikah and ziwaj 
and this nikah and ziwaj refers to marriage between a man and a woman and subhanallah you can look at how futuristic these scholars were uh, little did they know that we have come to a time when uh, marriage you know has become so distorted huh? now you find a woman marrying a woman a man marrying a woman so in islam the moment you talk about ziwaj or a nikah it is basically between a man and a woman huh? and uh, you find a lot of all these um, uh, kind of uh, you know things that are not in line with islam going on so uh, this expression is very very fundamental huh? as far as the view of shafi is concerned hmm? then contracts can also be in any form of language which is acceptable it can be in writing so nowadays uh, you know most of us we use either our uh, smartphones or we use uh, computers hmm? uh, to you know send the offers and acceptance for the kind of contracts that we want to do and previously people would write you know send in writing hard copy which in many countries still it is there uh, but in more advanced countries people now rely on on computers hmm, to express the deal hmm. then there is a communication by conduct what they call ta'ati or mu'ata hmm. and this mu'ata subhanallah these uh, scholars had discussed earlier that it is conducting a contract without any verbal expression like the use of your atm this is called mu'ata and a lot of other uh, you know activities that we do now today even you go to a shopping center uh, you can conduct your 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 contract without even saying a word uh, because all the prices are there you come to the counter they use the mouse um, on the, the the barcode of those prices and everything is just conducted by action uh, called Mu'ata. So all the scholars are validated except the Shafi is worried about Mu'ata because of Al Gharar. So this is common now. Uh, we are using machines and uh, we use internet banking, etc. Then there is also another expression which is the sign language, and this is particular for people. Uh, who cannot uh, talk, who are incapable of speech. But subhanAllah, today we have a lot of devices. Even some of these people can use those devices to learn how to write. Uh, they can write using those resources. And we have a lot of uh, schools, universities uh, for the deaf and uh, those who are incapable of speech. So this has helped a lot to also facilitate. Uh, contracts for this kind of people hmm. then the other channel of communication um, you will find that there are certain contracts which requires only one medium uh, but some contracts may require several medium for example it may require uh, verbal communication followed by writing and some will require engagement like zoom people discuss especially government contracts it takes a lot of time and then they may require different channels to ensure that the contracting parties precisely understand what they want to do now moving forward these are the three conditions for a channel of communication uh, meaning if you want to express your offer if you want to offer something and for that person to accept these three conditions must be made in fiqh one is that the expression between hijab and kabul the offer and acceptance must be very clear uh, clear enough to reveal the intention of the contracting parties whether that expression is verbally or in writing or in any other form it must be very clear and secondly the offer and acceptance must have an agreement that means whatever you offer should be exactly what the other person needs Otherwise, there will be a lot of communication to ensure that uh, whatever specification of the goods, and particularly for those who now use online buying and selling, uh, and there are a lot of dis descriptions on the screen of what you need. So you have to ensure that the specification of what you need on the screen is exactly uh, what you want to buy. And so once you communicate your intention to, 
the the platform so the other side must really ensure that it is exactly what you want to buy and there has to be a continuity meaning that if you are really interested in the offer and acceptance there doesn't have to be a break because when there's a break it shows the other party is hesitant uh, so the idea of majlis is very important the session where there is a constant communication uh, depending on the nature of the contract such communication may take a week a day and big contracts may even take months of negotiation uh, so these are very important conditions when you talk about offer and acceptance uh, it has to be very clear uh, the two parties must agree that whatever contracts they are signing is exactly what they need to do and then there has to be a kind of a continuity to show that they have commitments towards that contract now we move on to the next stage which is the termination of contract i'm sure many of you know that usually we have offers and acceptance in terms where people give notice to one another when they want to terminate a contract and uh, sometimes uh, the contract can be terminated even before the maturity when there are violations of the terms or the company has to be liquidated because of merger uh, with another company or they are selling the company or the subject matter in which the contract is on has been damaged maybe due to natural circumstances or other issues that may affect the loss of the subject matter then this warrant the termination uh, of a contract now we enter into a very interesting <laughs> area which is the contracting purchase if you remember we said there are four pillars one is the expression and secondly is the contracting purchase one and two uh, this is three and then the fourth one is the subject matter now who are those contracting parties now you will agree with me that the nature of business differ uh, internationally in some of our countries uh, we still have a huge informal sector where sole proprietorship dominates the market meaning people to people engagement and um, in other areas uh, you have more of companies uh, people initiate companies which we call it the legal person so you have a real person as the contracting parties and then you have the legal person as the contracting parties now we'll be looking first at the real person then we look at the legal person now for the real persons uh, we know that there is a very important concept which is called ahliya uh, the suitability of people to perform a contract we know that people differ in nature they differ in their capacities they differ in age intelligence physics etc so the sharia takes into consideration that these differences creates different suitability for people for certain contract for example uh, a child may not be suitable for certain contracts a person who is insane has certain um uh, what we call it uh, hindrance to perform certain kind of contracts therefore some people are not suitable to perform any contract and some people are suitable to perform certain contracts while others alhamdulillah have the ability to perform all kinds of contracts and this suitability is what we call in sharia al ahliya hmm? um, so now the suitability of uh, contracts in sharia is classified into two one is called ahliyatil wujub the legal capacity to acquire rights uh, because before you conduct a contract i think that big question comes uh, do you have the right to conduct that contract uh, are you rightfully qualified for the contract then the next question then comes are you able to perform the contract you may have the right but you may not be able to perform the contract or the contract is there but you don't have the right to perform the contract so the concept of ahliyatul wujub legal capacity to acquire rights and ahliyatul ada the legal capacity to perform a contract is very very fundamental as far as islam is concerned and now we look at this ahliya in detail 
So Ahlia is classified again into two. Um, Ahlia al wujub you have incomplete Ahlia, and then you have complete Ahlia. Then Ahlia al ada you have incomplete, and then you have complete Ahlia. Now, what does it mean? A contracting party who is an individual. Let's take the case of a child. Um, can a child, for example, go to the shop and buy things? Um, is such a contract valid? Can an insane person, a person who is mentally deranged, perform a contract? In other words, when we take a child, for example, then we have to look at these two categories. Uh, the right of a child to perform a contract and his ability to perform a contract. Either it is al ujub or al ada. Now, with this child, is his right complete or incomplete? Uh, his ability to perform a contract, is it complete or incomplete? So, this is basically what we are talking about. Now, this we can only discuss when we look at it within what we call adwar, the faces. Mm? And that is very, very interesting. And um, for your information, subhanAllah, Islam is uh, perhaps the only religion that has discussed these levels of ahliya legal capacity. Now, let us look at the legal capacity to acquire rights. Mm? And then later we'll look at the legal capacity to perform a contract. So the Sharia classifies five levels of Ahliya. One is the fetus, meaning the child after fertilization, that development of the child in the womb of the mother is called fetus. And subhanAllah, the Sharia assign rights to this child. As I said, no other system has given so much right to this child as Islam has done. And then after the child is born alive, from birth to seven years is called a pufula or infancy. Then another seven years to the life of the child until the child becomes adult, is called childhood tamiz. Then you add another seven years to the life of the child after 21, is called a rushd, which is maturity. So you see, so Islam classifies this uh, child development into seven, seven, seven. And later we'll see there are maqula, which people attribute to hadith and other says are views of scholars. So, for a contracting party or the ahliya to acquire rights and ahliya to perform a contracts, as seen within these five levels, uh, the level of the child in the womb of the mother, nine months, then the child is born alive, seven years in the life of the child, which is called pofola. Another seven years in the life of the child is called temyiz. Another seven years is called adulthood. And then after adulthood, you have a rush. So how does Islam look at this development as far as Ahliyat al-Wujub and Ada is concerned? Now, from the level of fetus, that means the child is developing in the womb of the mother the rights of the child is considered incomplete. Why incomplete? Because the child still depends on the mother. And secondly, this right is subject to the child being born alive. So what are those rights that Islam gives to the child or the fetus in the womb? Islam gives four rights to the child while the child develops for nine months in the womb of the mother. The first right Islam gives is called the right of parenthood. The child has the right to call a father. In other words, the child has a right for fatherhood uh, to say, oh, my father. And the child also has the right to say, my mother. 
the child has the right of parenthood. Now, these rights can only be fulfilled if the marriage is done legally, is done based on Sharia. Nikah is valid. But if the child is born out of marriage, then the child loses these important rights. That is why in Sunnah, when the child is born, and uh, if Qadr Allah, the child passed away after birth, then the Sunnah requires that the child be given a name before the child is buried. And this is to fulfill that right of parenthood of this calling a father and a mother. The child has to have a name. Now, the second right which Islam gives to the child is the right of inheritance. That means this child who is developing in the womb of the mother for nine months has the right to inherit. And so again, this inheritance will be fulfilled when the child is born alive. Um, so if a child is born out of wedding, um, that means born out of legal nikah, then the child is excluded from this inheritance. Uh, there are only exceptions which we saw in war zone areas, like what happened to our uh, brothers and sisters in the war in Bosnia and other Muslim areas where our sisters are forced to get you know children out of wedding uh, because of the act of our enemies. So the scholars. Uh, have uh, come up with the fatwa that a child can inherit from the mother in this case. So the second is the right of inheritance. The third is the right of waqaf. Uh, waqaf means we have usually family waqaf that we initiate so the child deserves that waqaf. And then the fourth right is the right of wasiyya. So the child deserves a will uh, from people other than the parents yeah, and they can give a will to the child. So these four rights are very very important and they can only be fulfilled after the child is born alive. Can they, that fetus perform a contract? Of course it is nil. A da is nil. The contract is nil and then the ruling is that he cannot. So once the child is born alive from birth to seven years we call it tufula. Now here the child has complete rights. And subhanAllah, many scholars, uh, they say that the seven years of a child, uh, the child can only receive gifts. Mm. Uh, things that come to the child is considered acceptable, but subject to the ratification by the parents. It is the parents who should accept those gifts on behalf of the child. In other words, the contract that the child performs um, is dependent on the ratification of the parents. So the third stage is what we call tamiz, uh, where the child begins to distinguish between good and bad. And in this third level, which usually happens uh, when the child begins to enter the next phase of the seven years of age, seven to 14. Hmm? And here his right is complete, but the performance of the contract is still incomplete. Uh, especially, uh, according to the Hanafi school, he has three levels of contract. The first is the contract which uh, takes ownership away from the child. And this requires uh, verification or ratification by the parents. And things which brings ownership to the child uh, such as gifts, etc., also will require ratification from the parents. The third one is buying and selling. Mm -hmm. Children can be sent to buy things or to sell things uh, from age of seven to 14. Uh, and so this is uh, acceptable. And then ad adulthood is where uh, the child becomes bailik, and this is where all the rights to uh, a contract is complete. That means the child has complete suitability to acquire rights and uh, because he's an adult already then has continue, uh, suitability to perform all kinds of contracts. Mm. Now 
interestingly, we see that uh, apart from the real person, there's also a legal person. And in the legal person, subhanAllah, the time is moving very, very fast. Huh? Um, I'll leave with another 10 minutes, so I have to rush. So the legal person is companies. So what are the legal capacity of companies? Uh, companies usually their qualifications are uh, stipulated in the rules and regulations of uh, the registrars of companies. Um, uh, how a company qualify for certain sector <clears throat> or qualify for certain activity depending on the kind of members, paid up capital, activities, etc. So their the ahliya is determined by law, hmm? determined by law. Now, so these are the obstacles to contracting parties who are um, real persons. Um, you cannot perform a contract if you're insane, uh, you have feeble mind, unconscious people, or you're in sleep, or those in terminal sickness. And some scholars also include drunkenness. Uh, you cannot perform a contract. And those who are extravagant in the way they spend their money. And also those in debt or bankruptcy. Uh, that is why when people go to acquire additional fund or loan, usually the banks will look at your credit rating. Uh, if you have high debt ratio, then you become disqualified to perform those kind of a contract again for a legal person this is determined by the law so the subject matter of a contract uh, it could be monetary assets it could be usufruct etc and it could it must be something which is sharia compliant uh, whether you're talking about goods services or usufructs or money it must be sharia compliant it must be present during the time of the contract uh, and it should be deliverable, whether real or constructive, and it must be specifically known to the contracting parties. Mm -hmm. Finally, we come to the objective of the contract. And here we are talking about that the objective of a contract, uh, we have two objectives. One is the primary objective, and secondly is the secondary objective. The primary objective is the Sharia objective, and the secondary objective is the objective of the contracting parties. So I'm giving here three examples. Let's say for buying and selling, the Sharia says you must exchange asset and price. That means the seller must deliver the goods and the buyer must deliver the price. Now, if the buyers and sellers want to conform to the objective of the Sharia, then they must exchange both counter values. But if you do buying and selling without exchanging both assets and price, then this goes against the primary objectives of the Sharia. And when you go to Ijara, which is lease, you need to exchange usufruct with price. That means you pay the price and get the usufruct, or you get the usufruct and pay the price. And if you don't do this kind of activities, then you go against the primary objectives of the Sharia. Likewise for gifts. When we give gifts, we give an asset and do not get return for that asset. But if you give a gift and tell the other person, oh, you know, my gift is expensive, can you pay half of the gift? Then this contravenes the primary objective uh, of the Sharia. So we need to look at all those objectives from the different contracts if we want to ensure that our objectives as contracting parties conform to the objectives of the Sharia. Now, there are uh, arguments about the apparent and hidden motive of uh, the contracts. Uh, should we look at the hidden motive when we decide on the objectives of a contract or we only look at the apparent objective? For example, if somebody is selling, is having a wine factory and that wine uses grapes and you are having a grape farm, 
you are an agriculturalist, you sell grapes. Then that person comes to you and say, I want to buy your grapes. Now, one school said you need to look at the hidden motive, meaning that person is coming to buy grapes because he wants to go and make wine. So you don't need to sell grapes to that person. But the second school said, so long as that person does not say, I want to buy grapes to make wine, then you just need to sell grapes because the intention is not apparent. Uh, it is hidden. So these are the two arguments in the schools. And when we discuss those practices uh, next week, inshallah, we shall see some of the contention about the translation of these two motives, apparent and hidden motive in a contract. Finally, we look at the classification of the contract very fast. We can classify a contract in terms of the lawfulness. Uh, that means uh, it should be Sharia compliant. We look at its validity. We look at the pricing. And then we look at whether it is unilateral or bilateral. Other classification of contracts are contracts of mu'awadat, contracts of exchange, like al murabaha sale or salam. Salam is a forward sale where we give the goods in advance and receive the money later. And other types of contract is called ukhuda shirka, contracts of partnership such as al musharaka where contracting parties contribute capital, or mudaraba, where one party contributes capital and the other one manages the funds. And then we have Uqud al-Manfa, contracts of usufruct, uh, whether the lease is on assets or the lease is on person. And inshallah, next week we'll see that also in terms of lease, we have operating lease and then we have uh, what we call um, um, asset lease uh, where, or financial lease. Uh, we have operating lease and financial lease. Uh, which we'll discuss in the next class. The other classification is Uqud al tawthiqat contracts of security like Ar-Rahnu and like Al-Kafala. Hmm? Uh, Ar-Rahnu is basically a pledge or a security as a collateral. Then Al-Kafala is somebody uh, providing guarantee or surety. al wadia is usually used in deposits, uh, Islamic deposits. And then other forms of valuable, if you put as an amana trust, this is called contracts of wadi'a. Ah. Then you have contracts of agency like awakala agency. And then al-ju'ala is a contract which uh, is based on rewards. Uh, you do certain activities and then you earn the rewards. And finally, we have contracts of the barra'at, contracts of charity like sadaqat or gifts, hiba. And then contracts of that like qard, and then a salam, which we saw earlier. Qard is basically money loan. And then contracts of sarf of money exchange, uh, or we exchange financial assets. Uh, all these are classification that are defined in the Sharia. So to conclude within this one minute, that for a valid contract, the parties may ensure that all those essential elements and their conditions are in place. So what are those essential elements? You must ensure that uh, there is a valid uh, expression or channel of communication for both the offer and acceptance. This channel could be expressed verbally or in writing or through action or through sign languages. We must ensure that the contracting parties are there to contract the transaction, whether such contracting parties are real persons or they are companies. And then we have to ensure also that the subject matter on which the contracts uh, are based are uh, available during the time of the contracts. Here, yeah, basically, we are talking about the price and then the goods or the use of rights or the services. And finally, we have to ensure that in any kind of a contract, uh, the secondary objectives of the contracting parties must conform to the primary objectives. Uh, if we are doing sale, then we should know what is the Sharia objectives for sale. If we are giving loan, what is the Sharia objectives of loan? 
if we are exchanging money, what is the Sharia objectives of exchanging money? If you are entering into partnership, what is that primary objectives which the Sharia wants from us when we enter into partnership? So any violation of the primary objectives of the Sharia based on the motive of the contracting parties render such a contract invalid. So basically this is in short what we have uh, discussed today on the theoretical aspects of the contract. Now I wait for your question and answer within these uh, seven minutes, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we go straight to Brother Mustafa Ibrahim. Uh, after contract has been sealed, but the seller decided not to sell anymore without stating the reason for not selling it. Is this allowed in Islam? Yeah, okay. So that's a very good, interesting question. Now, if uh, after the contract has already been sealed, now the seller doesn't want to sell, there has to be uh, a reason. This has to be stipulated in the terms and condition of a contract. Um, for example, um, some of the, uh, the conditions that are stipulated will say that you have to deliver. But if these conditions remain open, uh, that means both contracting parties have not stipulated on what this condition is, uh, then either the arbitration goes through the court uh, to decide who is right, who is wrong, and or uh, we again revisit that contract and see what it is. But normally what comes is yeah, the issue of cost. If, for example, the cost is involved, then the seller has to pay the cost. A typical example we see is in Estesna construction uh, contract in most of the banks. Uh, if you don't deliver the goods at that specified period of time, then there are costs involved. So you have to pay the cost which is incurred uh, by the other person. So I think typically the most important thing would be the issue of cost. Uh, by cancelling the contract, how much does it impact uh, on the buyer? What are the costs involved? And in many European countries, you have these laws of uh, uh, litigation and some of the costs can be very high. It could be psychological costs, it could be etc. cetera costs. Uh, so my advice is that um, uh, the, the nature of a contract that is signed, the terms and conditions have to be very, very specific. Uh, so that uh, no other party could cancel at will. And usually there is a notice. Uh, in any contract, there's a notice. People will give notice. Uh, there is an article which says, before we terminate a contract, we can terminate at any time by giving certain notice uh, to, the, to the person. I think that those are usually part of the, uh, the contract. So depending on how the, the terms are written, yeah, the contract. Next one, my brother, Adaha. Is the Islamic contract approach based on the framework of all institutional economics, OIE? How does this approach deal to the problem of bounded rationality in the agent of economic behavior, such as moral hazard, asymmetric formation, etc.? Okay, that's a good question because this one we are going to discuss next week, but having said that, the moment you talk about institutional economics, the underlying theory of institutional economics is that um, the human behavior, uh, you know, our behavior, our norms uh, are governed by the social norms around us. For example, like how do you conduct your trade? How do you conduct uh, uh, your buying and selling? So it is that social norm. And for our case, it will be like the Sharia norm that guides our behavior. Uh, that is why for those who do studies on institutional economics, I find there's quite a lot of relevance of institutional economics to Islamic, uh, you know, uh, deliberation economics and particularly the contracts, which I do agree. Now, bounded rationality means that um, the classical rationality, um, uh, by bounded rationality means the Sharia tends to guide your rationality. It is no longer like the, the assumed rationality in the classical way. Uh, People just need more and more and more. Um, so in a bounded rationality, which is also um, uh, a view by Nobel Prize uh, winners in economics, 
they say the Sharia tend to, you know, contain your kind of rationality that you come up with, uh, which I think um, there's nothing wrong Islamically talk about bounded rationality. And some people also talk about constraint and restraint in your rationality. So I think the two basically can go together. One is providing the norm at a theoretical level, and the other one as an individual at a micro level, then your rationality is bounded by those uh, Sharia norms. Yeah, both can go. The most simple one, what is the specific legal capacity of a minor, a minor to engage in contract in Islam? All our, our child. Okay, that's, okay, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it depends on the, the different madhahib. Uh, for example, the Hanafi school are the most lenient in terms of legal capacity for children. Uh, and in fact, in my slide that I have given, uh, it deals more on the Hanafi school. For the Hanafi school, they say, uh, in fact, at the age of seven, uh, which we call the age of Tamiz, uh, uh, seven until 14, already the child can begin uh, engaging in buying and selling with the guidance of the other parents. But when you go to the Shafi school, Shafi is very strict, uh, very, very, very strict. Uh, Shafi does not allow any financial engagement uh, except after you reach the age of maturity, Arrushti. And so um, uh, if you are going to apply the Shafi school, then you have to ensure that your children don't engage in business until they become matured. So, given the current situation, I think the, the Hanafi fiqhs tend to be uh, practical and because today many of our children mature early uh, because of the nature of food, the nature of climate and their engagement with, the, uh, with technology, you find they develop a lot of uh, you know, maturity early. So, I think um, once we, a child cross that age of seven, uh, the child should be allowed uh, to have that uh, incomplete uh, suitability of engaging into buying and selling with the support of the, the parents, yeah. Simple, Simple one from Mr. Zahalima. Uh, is a marital contract with terms on divorce a valid one? Is a what? A marital contract with a terms mm. on divorce, yeah, some marital... <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> okay, taken. yes. Yeah, I like, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, that's a very invalid contract because here you see, subhanAllah, um, when you see the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, uh, Allah says, I am the partner in a partnership of two, so long as the other party does not betray uh, the other party. So if you are signing a contract of marriage with the intention of divorce, this is already a khiyana. Hmm? Uh, and some people, some scholars, they say, no, you don't need to know the other party. You don't need to let the other party know that you're going to divorce him or her. Even this becomes a bigger khiyana because that party may be assuming that we are going to have Alhamdulillah, a long-term relationship, we are going to have a very good marriage, then suddenly you terminate the marriage, and then there's a lot of impact on that, uh, particularly rights of the children. You leave that lady as a single uh, parent. Why do you deny the children, you know, uh, the love of the two parents? So based on the objectives of marriage, I don't think this is valid because uh, marriage has to be long-term. And in fact, uh, in other hadith, people pray that uh, their husbands and wives, they should meet in Jannah. So it's a long-term marriage. And you need children who will pray for you, Saleh, while you're in the grave. And uh, so one of uh, an institution in Islam, which is a very serious institution, is marriage, which we should not joke with it. That's why in the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, it says, khams, five things, jidduhunna jid, Five things, uh, they are serious. Even if you joke with them, they are still serious. You cannot joke with them. And this is, includes marriage, divorce. Divorce is also, you cannot make such a joke with the divorce. To me, my view is, it's an invalid contract. And uh, 
uh, Muslims should avoid this kind of a contract. Uh, if you're not serious in marriage, please uh, don't play with other people's lives. And uh, we must maintain our institution of marriage uh, because this is where a lot of things depend in Islam. So I disagree with this, with this view. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this uh, issue of contract is very, very important in our daily life that we mostly take it for granted. Especially we make loan from friends. <laughs> we just yeah, borrow some money and then just forget about it for years <laughs> without any witness or any written statement. Okay, Prof, one or two minutes, final remarks before we close. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, the final remark that I would like to uh, tell the, uh, the, the, the listeners and the viewers as a take home is that uh, uh, inshallah next week we'll be looking at a lot of those uh, practical aspects of uh, uh, the contract. Uh, but the most fundamental thing, and, and I like some of the questions that I raise, is that uh, as time goes on and may Allah save, we will see a lot of discrepancies between what is actually uh, the primary object of the Sharia in those contracts and then the behavior of the contracting parties and the behavior of the institutions around us. So our main effort as Muslims, inshallah, as a good Muslim, is to ensure that we narrow the gap uh, between the Sharia requirements and the practices in the market, wherever we are, uh, this is uh, the message for everybody, inshallah, when we meet next week. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. See you next week, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam.